Welcome to the founders of Web3 series by Outlier Ventures and me, your host, Jamie Burke. Together, we're going to meet the entrepreneurs, their backers, and the leading policymakers that are shaping Web3. Together, we're going to try to define what is Web3, explore its nuances, and understand the mission and purpose that drive its founders. If you enjoy what you hear, please do subscribe, rate, and share your feedback to help us reach as many people as possible with the important mission that is Web3. Okay, so today we've got Mark Wilcox of 21E8, the magic number company, working on computational data markets. Uh, I know that begs the question, what the hell does that mean? So we're going to kind of delve into that. Actually, I've known Mark virtually for some time now, probably almost as long as I've been in crypto and blockchain. Actually only got to meet in person, physically, uh, in London uh, recently, just before the corona outbreak. And we'll probably never get to meet ever again. So um, it's, it's good to have you on the podcast. Yeah, it's, uh, it was good to see you, you know, a few weeks ago. And it's an interesting time we're in. But uh, yeah, I've been uh, kind of based down in New Zealand, kind of working on the side on, on a bunch of um, technology. And, and the timing is just interesting as it's kind of coming to market and coming to fruition. And uh, the world is changing a lot. And it seems like... Uh, there's a, a lot of benefits that um, these types of ideas can can help us with. Well, yeah, I mean, especially if you think, you know, Bitcoin came about during the last financial crash, uh, crash and crisis. So um, let's see what comes out of this one. Also, I guess, you know, you are based in the place where all the billionaires are now flying in their private jets to escape Armageddon. So you're probably doing all right. So by way of background, Actually, I knew you when you were working at Nuriade, uh, also based in uh, New Zealand. And I've always struggled to explain what that company did. It was uh, wonderfully complex, but I believe was born out of, was spun out of a global distributed satellite dish system, right? So, so I know you, you've, got, you've got some pretty good chops when it comes to solving very complex technical problems. And now that's being applied in this new startup. So in this series, we're interviewing uh, the founders of Web3. And I've always kind of had a keen eye on seeing what you would do when you left uh, Niriaid. And that's now born out as 21E8. So maybe before we go into, you know, what is the magic number company and how that can be applied to computational data markets, It'd be just good to understand your background. As I understand it, it's a mixture of gaming, media, and supercomputing. But maybe if you could kind of give the listeners a a high-level summary of those skill sets and then how they kind of are applied um, in your new startup. Sure, yeah. So, um, like, my background originally was, uh, like, communications and media. I, um, you know, worked on... When I was in university, I did, like, a lot of esports stuff, uh, um, producing content in the community, um, you know, working with people who built uh, uh, websites and built mods and, um, and and ran tournaments and so on. And so I got a kind of really early uh, uh, good feeling for how the gaming business worked, uh, how uh, players and content creators added value and, uh, and you know, created network effects that could actually be sustainable businesses, not just for uh, the you know the game developer, but lots of different people in the communities. Uh, and that was around the time that, that Twitch, you know, came about. So it used to be that people would they would do shoutcasts and they would kind of stream the audio, and you would have to do complicated things to sync up the the uh, the stream audio and the and the game that you were watching, uh, and then people would record them and they would play them back. And then that turned into into live streaming as the uh, the internet really improved. And then uh, after I uh, finished university, I basically realized that uh, you know this the whole um, media industry was just kind of falling apart. That it didn't look like a very sustainable type of profession to go into. Um, so I I went and started working for startups. This is around the time that you know, and and that was around the same time that I I got into Bitcoin um, and. Uh, it, it was also when uh, GPU mining and FPGA mining were, were happening. 
uh, and Ethereum was really, were really kind of coming onto the scene. And uh, that first uh, startup that I worked at, we um, were doing kind of location-based augmented reality, and we were trying to deal with a lot of uh, issues around lighting and ray tracing and, and things in the scene that required a lot of real-time data sources, but also like offloaded compute. Um, and at the time, they felt like there was, uh, you know, there were all these people kind of putting GPUs uh, in their you know, home down the street. There should have been a way to call out to them and uh, and offload some some sort of processing. You know, what one of the uh, the early kind of use cases that people would talk about with Ethereum was, well, you should be able to uh, rent out your Wi-Fi. So as you walk down the street, you could just buy Wi-Fi from people. And it felt like that was a really, you know, physical opportunity. Hey, there were some GPUs in, in, in some house that you're walking by. You should be able to just, you know, get some com- com- low latency compute from them. And it was around this time that I m- met Alex St. John. Alex was the um, original creator of DirectX back in the 90s at Microsoft. And and so DirectX was really the the API platform that led to the creation of the GPU. In the same way that, uh, that you know, Bitcoin led to the creation of, of SHA-256 ASICs, how TensorFlow API has led to the creation of all these new um, AI processes. And he taught me a lot about economic, the economics of compute and how uh, kind of insatiable demand for real time, you know, highly, uh, like really, really good looking graphics and, and interactivity. It was really like the driver of, of most c- computing hardware and, and uh, real time software. And so he, he, when I met him, he was basically in the process of, he just moved to New Zealand. He was involved in this project called the Square Kilometre Array, which was a radio telescope and, uh, that they're building in, in Australia. Um, yes. And uh, essentially and across it's... Across South uh, Africa as well, right, I believe. Yeah, so, so, it's, uh, so it's basically two telescopes. Um, they operate at different frequency bands. Uh, and essentially they, uh, they have two supercomputers on site where they basically take a huge amount of raw signal data and then they put that into a big GPU FPGA supercomputer uh, and do a fast Fourier transform on it to take all the little independent signals and, and produce a, you know, a, a, a four, four dimensional, you know, like a three dimensional data set over time. And then they kind of can model, model back to the, the big bang. They're trying to search for, for echoes in the universe. Uh, and the amount of data that they had to process through that system is more that that goes through the internet and it's just basically one noise. But anyway, so they had a really difficult infrastructure problem, which was essentially they, they had to you know, build this telescope and run it for essentially, you know, decades, like 50 years. And the data rates are so enormous and they're going to keep growing that telescope that the idea of having to move you know, having to do your computation and then also move it over to storage and then load it back uh, over again was just looking completely infeasible. And um, at, so at the time, you know, people were talking about putting GPUs like closer to storage and everything. And we realized that, you know, you needed a storage architecture where the the, the data, the place that the data was uh, being processed and the place that it was being stored were as close together as physically possible. But while still being able to have all the error tolerance and upgradability and everything that you would that you would get from um, storage. So rather than having one big supercomputer and one big storage system, you would have compute and storage close together, but con- constantly working uh, off of one another. And would it be fair to say at, at the edge? Would that be a way that you would describe no, it? Or well, is it? well, this is a weird thing. So it's not just about the edge or the cloud. It's a whole system. So the edge was the you know, the actual radio antenna in the outback, right? And they would attach little uh, mobile processor GPUs uh, with FPGAs on them to that uh, single signal. But then they would have to aggregate all of that. And then it, once it was in, the, it, it, once it's in the data center, it's still a, it's still like a, a, a complex graph problem. It's not just like, well, we put it in the big data center thing and we have it there. It's just as difficult and uh, complex once you get into the system. So in that like high, in order to have a really, really, really high performance, reliable core, they actually had, you know, you had to have a, a parallel, like uh, a massively parallel distributed system in order to have the kind of density between nodes that like, instead of having one system that is at risk, 
and then having to back it up to a completely other system, you would have just a single, you know, really large cluster essentially that had all the data and it was doing all the compute, but you could take a node offline, you could put in, you could upgrade it, you know, this type of thing. And what was interesting was the actual, the, the front, that actual data problem was very interesting. So in, in the blockchain world, people can't think like we, okay, we have the data and then we need to distribute it. So, and, and then the more you're computing something on a single node, the harder it is to distribute. But in the radio telescope, you know, the signals are coming from a distributed system, right? And then the process of figuring out the answer is to take every single piece of data and then combine it with every other piece of data and, uh, and then have your output, right? And because the data was distributed in the first place, as long as you cached it, then you could, you didn't have to worry about the final result being lost because you could just recalculate it and you would just cache, cache the results, you know, as you went. So in a system like that, what are you, what are you optimizing for? You're not optimizing presumably for security or latency. It, it's, it's something different. So you're, you're optimizing just for pure power efficiency, essentially like at a certain scale, like a supercomputing. And, and this is, you know, no, this is what everyone in supercomputing is dealing with right now anyway is that the energy cost is not from the computation, the energy cost is from moving the data, you know, over a wire. So you literally want to get as, and when you're actually doing the, the hard work to come to a conclusion, that is deal with the huge volumes of raw data and so on, uh, you need to, it just has few wires as possible. And so there are people, even now there are people building gigantic chips that are, you know, like a, like a pizza size GPU purely in order in order to you know not have any cables that would go back and forth and so that was a big driver it really said like hey the uh the cost of computing is not the power efficiency of the chip the cost of the computing is the is the network and uh and the the risk associated with you know running something on a on a really big expensive chip you know the fault tolerance that you need you you need to be able to get out of it and so once you started thinking in that way about uh how to solve the infrastructure problem like it was not a physical infrastructure problem anymore. It was a uh, energy efficiency uh, graph optimization problem. Then suddenly like even to think about how to run that type of system, you need a GPU, right? That's like these graph optimization problems are what GPUs are designed to solve. That's like a GPU is an ASIC. For these kinds of uh, graph optimization problems, uh, the GPU is really an ASIC. That's what it's like really kind of designed to do extremely well is really high throughput, large volumes of, uh, of parallel processing uh, and recognizing patterns and quickly connecting them. Uh, and that's why, you know, that's why they use for, you know, all artificial intelligence, uh, rendering, uh, you know, large uh, kind of real time uh, analysis work. And so when you think about these ideas of um, routing problems of, of scalability uh, and of centralization and decentralization kind of tensions, then uh, at, this, at the scale of uh, you know, an economy, uh, it's really impossible to even reason about these things without applying the, uh, without using the GPU, without using the same system to understand itself. In the world of HPC, you know, these questions of scalability aren't theoretical academic architecture design problems. They're hard problems with numbers uh, to say like, hey, we have a supercomputer where we need to design a, a more powerful one. And these are all of the constraints that, that we have on the system. So what's happened in the last you know, few years is essentially in order to continue to scale because the the scaling constraint of a supercomputer is not the amount of compute you know you can just buy as many servers that's just a constraint of money when you're actually trying to solve a problem in a supercomputer the constraint is the is the io is the communication between all the different nodes and then uh the 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 way that you you know you structure you design your program and the type of problem, you know, the inherent limits to, to the problem that you're trying to solve. But, but especially, uh, you know, practically a lot of it is, is how you actually structure the code such that the data is as independent as possible. So when you're, when you're not needing to move data over a slow network, like in between nodes, 
then you can and you can stay in memory uh, but you can be confident that the whole you know workload is doing its job properly and staying in sync then you can um, then you can achieve uh, pretty good performance numbers but what ha has happened is uh, as the amount of data that is being used in these systems and the amount of data that is being generated like within a simulation has just exploded is that in order to keep data off of the network you basically need to continuously train a, a model uh, on those, those data sets that then you can understand what is the uh, topology what are the upcoming data dependencies that you need to be aware of so that then you can prioritize the traffic so obviously you're working on a lot of this stuff in parallel to i guess a personal interest in in bitcoin crypto generally uh, your work there wasn't kind of directly linked or, or was it what was the what was the relationship between your interest in 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 bitcoin and crypto and and your day job so like i mean as i was saying uh when i got into it is that uh you know it felt like there was a, a both a, a physical uh you know computing energy latency problem to solve that needed some gpus over a network and needed interactivity and, and, and this type of thing but also some sort of market economics problem to actually make it possible to connect things up and at the, you know, when you're dealing in supercomputing where, you know, a single system that's designed to solve a very specific problems costs tens of millions of dollars, it is just an economics problem of, of how do you wire things together such that, you know, you, you can get the answers that you're looking for uh, with, while using as little energy and, and, and getting as much simulations or jobs through the system as you can possibly get for, for your money. So it is, once you're at a certain scale, uh, the computing problems are just the economics problems. And, and, and we really had to model that. We had to understand it in order to uh, even make it possible to, to run these types of, of systems. So I was thinking a lot about, you know, it, it, it felt like there was an obvious connection. It made sense that if you thought about it, that, about these systems and these type as economic systems, you know, that could have their own accounting systems and have their own way to uh, be resilient and, and, and account for error, uh, then you could, that could be very useful on a wider scale. You know, like we weren't trying to build a company that just sold one thing to, to one uh, supercomputing business. We were trying to uh, build a general purpose uh, technology. And I think what ended up happening is, well, I, I, in the earlier days, uh, I expected the, um, you know, the crypto market to evolve in this direction naturally. I think we kind of got distracted by a lot of uh, like financialization and ICOs that really took away from uh, what was happening in, in around like 2013 and 2014 with, um, with mining, because it became just not about mining at all. Um, there was obviously uh, like a, a mining boom with GPUs, but that wasn't really drive, that wasn't the driver of the network value. It, it, that was just people playing catch up to uh, you know the whole whole kind of bubble in, in 2017. So what we saw was you know a whole bunch of interesting, exciting projects and ideas that we didn't have the right technology architecture for. It couldn't scale, uh, and the infrastructure and everything that went into this generation of of uh, infrastructure uh, of, of you know of of the network and and the people involved. Ha hasn't really uh, created a new platform for people to build these applications on. We have we have a bunch of interesting projects and 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 concepts that are that have now been turned in, into code. Uh, that there's an opportunity to get to get running again. You know, get running on a live network with the billions that have gone into this new infrastructure around crypto generally. Do you think any of that is is useful? Or will be useful has the potential to be useful in the context of some of the problems that you were trying to optimize for in in your previous role or do you actually think most of it is kind of largely just this experimental sandbox there's some good conceptual learnings but there's there's no real tangible technology that that, that could be leveraged so so these two real pieces of infrastructure right well maybe three so like we can just put the financial like tooling speculative market infrastructure which is useful for valuing things 
um, we can put that aside. Let's look at the hard infrastructure, right? So in terms of consensus, right, we have ASICs. We have uh, dedicated machines that are that are there who their function is to solve, you know, proof of work problems. And and that is uh, that you can't take that infrastructure and really use it for anything that's not consensus. You have the, the definition of, of like the use of usefulness of proof of work is a, is in building consensus. The other half, you know, side of the infrastructure is in this general purpose compute that has been running other other blockchains. So proof of work for Ethereum, also like people using GPUs to then like you know run compute jobs and, and things that have come from Ethereum. Because Ethereum has you know been a, a decent way to write some general purpose thing, put it on the blockchain and get people involved. You know, there's a decent amount of of infrastructure out there, but it, they, but those systems don't have the the same economic driver that a proof of work has that you know ends up with millions of GPUs on on Ethereum in the first place. So although there's been a lot of you know because these things are extremely you know like valued uh, at a at a really high number, there is a lot of infrastructure that is has uh, you know been put in place, but most of it is all there in the consensus layer. So you need to essentially in order to figure out how to take advantage of, of this investment that has been put in, you need to start to figure out a way to formulate more valuable consensus problems to solve. From proof, proof of work? Well, like a, proof of work is the, is the way that you account for it. You know, solving a consensus problem is still a human, it's still a social economic problem. Uh, it's just that that is the infrastructure that's available. And so in order to benefit from this whole ecosystem that you, you need to formulate, a, to, 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 to turn it into something more valuable, you need to find ways to, to continuously use that existing infrastructure and put it towards something that is even more profitable, even an even better speculative investment essentially to build consensus over than, uh, than just running a, the base blockchain right so you kind of need this feedback loop in a way so you know we had this financial layer it's it's created enough value or driven enough speculative value that it's managed to, to kind of mobilize bottom up this this compute global network yeah, so, of compute so layer isn't really the right way to think about it because all there is is a ledger right and there's a network of computers who are building and sharing that ledger. That is just data, which has the all of the compute, the um, networking, the ASIC hardware attached to it. And then the financial stuff is is more uh, institutional infrastructure. It's uh, you know systems of of governance, uh, pools of capital for managing control over this ledger, but there's no real layer because it, it's one is a one is a like a, a social economic you know idea of finance and the other is just a file that, that people are sharing through their computer and so at the le level of the actual ledger you know there's no difference between money and data yes it's all data yeah it's all information okay so this you know led you into your new venture and i remember saying to you when you're in your previous role you know let me know when you move on to your your next thing and if you if you create a startup so here we are i guess you've been working on this particular project 2108 for a year or so i mean i'm sure intellectually maybe before that but in terms of actual code being written it's yeah so the company was founded in august ah okay so even even yeah. sooner and and we launched we launched the first piece of it in January. Right, um, and it looks like it's 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 getting some good traction. So you refer to it as the magic number company. Can you unpack that a little bit, and then we talk a little bit about the the application um, or applications that are possible when you can enable this computational data market. Uh, and obviously, mm -hmm. the linkage there is is that you've been presumably thinking about how you can create even greater economic incentives um, and markets that can drive 
presumably the, this next wave of speculative value. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, you know, magic number company. It sounds all cryptic and 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 uh, and things, and you know, people often put that on the onto the idea. Um, which is natural, like with, with crypto, it's, you know, things are encrypted. But a magic number in programming is basically just a protocol identifier. It, you know, when you have a, a, a file on your, on your file system, it will have a special flag uh, at, the, at the front of the file in the metadata that says, you know, hey, this is a JPEG. Or when you have a, uh, a networking packet come through, it will, you know, say, hey, this is this type of networking packet. And, you know, in, a, in, in your code, you will you will have this kind of constant uh, that you'll replace with some name that, that makes sense. Or, uh, or, a, or in, a, in, an, in a UI, then you would, you know, represent that in, in a way that is human meaningful. And that's, uh, that's known as Zuko's Triangle. Um, which is basically a tension between a, a um, machine readable ID and a, and a human meaningful name. So how this kind of, the, when it comes to crypto, this is actually really important because what we've, what we've seen with Ethereum is, uh, you know, people will have a new idea for, a, for solving some sort of domain specific problem. Uh, and so they'll create a new protocol. They'll create a new contract. Uh, and uh, issue new tokens and essentially, you know, fork the community and lose the network effect that came from people solving all these other problems before. So in order to really be able to build higher level, uh, you know, a bit more specialized systems that retain the economics and the, the network effect and, and the shared infrastructure as Bitcoin, we essentially need to be able to start to create new protocols that share the same uh, the new systems that share the same underlying you know protocol but can have different interfaces and different names and different brands and and so on uh, attached to the same system so when we say so the, the company is called 2028 because they're essentially you know, protocol identifier for the technology uh, and it also means that as a business, we can go out there and we can create a whole suite of business, like other businesses or, or applications or a, or a community that is using the same infrastructure without constraining their kind of uh, the way that they think about the network. So it, it provides this nice um, bridge between the basics of the underlying actually that exactly how the underlying data structure works and uh and a opportunity that then emerges from turning that into something human meaningful so you've created this technology as i understand it you've kind of released it into the wild and it's it's kind of getting some organic pickup and it its success looks like it's in its simplicity so as it stands right now there isn't a commercial entity necessarily that you can invest in um, you've open sourced this technology and already markets are starting to form. Um, and the idea is that, um, you know, there could be several marketplaces that form around computational data, leveraging proof of work. Can you talk about the, what, what you've released, how it's starting to be used and, and potentially the, the vision, long-term vision for that? Yeah. So, uh, Essentially, so there's a couple of things to, to your question. Uh, the first one is basically just, you know, what is it? Um, so what we've done is we've set, sort of generalized proof of work. We've said that, okay, we actually have, you know, multiple Bitcoins. We have lots of different blockchains out there. Can we start to think of like that whole market uh, just as one, you know, one ecosystem? Because it really kind of is. There's lots of people trading between different ledgers. And when it comes down to it, the, the real driver and under, the basis for the whole ecosystem is proof of work. It's this uh, you know, huge infrastructure, this huge capital investment uh, that there are people who are, you know, a, a lot of other people out there who are putting in just as much you know, time and energy and money as you. And that means that it's a, it's a market that kind of actually exists that you can rely on to, to invest in, to trade, to um, you know, build company as, and, and so forth. But we've had a real hard time in, uh, in turning that into something useful because we end up kind of having a false start every time we try to build a business on it. 
And that's because the way that we build businesses in the, in the software world is from trying to like, you know, build a startup, uh, have equity, build a platform, build a brand, get users, and somehow turn that into a, a, a company that is more, you know, benef- more, uh, more valuable than just, its, than just its revenue. And that really kind of doesn't work uh, in, in, in crypto because the base infrastructure you're relying on is the thing that, is, uh, that has the network effect that, ha- that the, you know, the users are really stuck to. So if you have, a, if you try to kind of capture your users in a, in a SaaS platform kind of thing, then they actually have, just have a really easy way to, to exit. Um, so we have this tension in, in the market between centralized, uh, you know, wallets and centralized exchanges where they don't really want, they want to keep the network effect on their system uh, and not have a network effect emerge around the blockchain. So you've had real kind of... Uh, constraints and restrictions um, put on these industry players to um, you know scare you into not uh, not leaving your coins on chain they'll say like hey you're gonna get hacked and this kind of thing or they'll say like hey you have to keep your co- coins in a cold wallet um, don't put them online don't put them on the network don't spend them because that empowers uh, these companies to to keep uh, to keep trading so that's a business model and economic incentive uh, thing and a tension between you know the fiat world uh, the fiat kind of uh, you know uh, uh, equity world and the blockchain world, but that uh, thing that they're really all still relying on is that same underlying proof of work network effect. Like without the uh, without the miners who are, who are there to attest to the um, currencies, you know none of these guys would have any business because the networks just wouldn't exist. You wouldn't even be able to deposit coins into an exchange. And so in order to really think about you know how to how to build more advanced, useful stuff, you really need to defend and build out that core infrastructure and that core thing that, that lets the market exist in the first place. And that is really proof of work. So proof of work kind of, it solves a really interesting problem, which is uh, if, you, if you take a, like a content addressable storage system, you know, or you know, we'll, we'll call it a data market like in the, in the basic version, is that you have a little discovery problem. You know, you have to know what content has already been stored in order to, to ask for it. Um, and, in all, and you also need to, uh, if, you, if you're storing something new, you need other people to know that that, that content exists, right? And so there's something like IPFS, it can only really take, it can only really handle uh, like a, a cold, well, not a cold data set, but a, but a historical data set, something that already exists. And proof of work, what it really did was it uh, created demand for future content. And it did that by, you know, signaling demand. So essentially a miner, you know, who's doing a lot of proof of work, they're saying they're trying to really put out a strong message to say like, hey, I will pay for some service or some content that doesn't exist in the market at the moment to pop up. And, uh, and when you look at the actual use of a checksum and the use of proof of work to game it, um, it becomes a really interesting, uh, it, it just naturally forms this information economy. So you get people who are able to uh, understand that there's some upcoming content, some upcoming data in the future, and you should pay attention to it. And you should maybe participate in the process of producing it because you can see that it's really you know valuable to these people who are who are wasting a lot of of compute on it and so if you really treat compute as the underlying currency which bitcoin does um, then you're able to understand you can connect the dots uh, between um, a actual piece of, of addressable content in the future and the amount of compute in the present so that is kind of at, when you when you take that concept and you generalize it. That's what I call a computational data market because it's a data market for um, content that is being computed in real time. So you don't know the uh, checksum of the actual data that you're trying to get. You don't know the results yet, but you can checksum the state of the application. You can checksum the code, 
And if there's enough of a strong economic signal behind it, then that can create the um, the space for people to come into and to to you know make that uh, prospect a reality. And so, what's the thing that? So, I mean, I get I get the principle that you know we need everybody needs proof of work to be economically viable or more viable, and that you you feel that there's this natural extension of how GPUs used um, beyond you know current mining activity towards uh, media and the general information economy yeah um, so how does how does 21e8 w- sorry what does 21e8 bring to catalyze that to, to make the shift? for for miners to then act to kind of focus that power around your content generally so if you think of you know in ethereum you have the base ledger you have the consensus layer of of the whole network uh, and then you have contracts that you can deploy onto that you know you create other higher level currencies so 21e8 is basically this idea that you can put different protocol identifiers on uh, a proof of work and then create a sort of, uh, you know, application specific chain, an application specific uh, data structure. But because you can just pay to use the underlying ledger, then you don't need to resolve and re-implement all the consensus, like all the data availability, sorry, and data distribution parts of the consensus. You just need to get agreement over over uh, the state of like uh, a contract. And that's what lets us ca- kind of do the design a blockchain, if you like, like create a market to compete over doing some application specific compute. Now, if we think about the use of a GPU, you know, a GPU is designed to render graphics. It's designed to do media processing, to do, you know, huge parallel, uh, anal- you know, data, uh, uh, AI processing and, and, and this kind of thing. So in the market, you know, it would make sense that all of the GPUs were trying to do the thing that was most valuable for the whole market instead of uh, designing currencies that then consumed a useful resource for the purpose of consensus when you could have a for their own sake. much more energy yeah. efficient, you know, better, you know, more accurate. Um, measure of, uh, of of doing that, um, and so it's not about using GPUs for proof of work. It's about using GPUs for work, right? And then you can compute a proof of that useful work that you did in a standard, measurable way. So uh, rather than think of um, you know twenty one e eight as a way to mine things by hashing them, it's a way to think about. Uh, the creation of new of new assets of content of uh, um, uh, of attesting you know uh, reputation into things that that gain trust and increase quality in the network it, uh, converting those into into you know registered assets on chain um, and then using the same proof of work economics as the underlying ledger to then extend up to the transa- to the to the level of transactions so miners are kind of looking to not just make their you know make a, a profitable block and make a bunch of transaction fees but actually participate to the maximum extent that they can have with their expertise and their infrastructure and their resources um, to make the economy the, the uh, as valuable as it could possibly be so when you get these weird, um, you know, situations where you have Silicon Valley funded startups who are looking to capitalize on the equity, it actually is in tension with a miner who is wanting to have something sort of like an equity or, or have that, uh, you know, the same uh, value that you get from, from that kind of technology, yeah. you know, in their own, <clears throat> in their own network effect, in their own platform, in their own <clears throat> infrastructure, and then charging, you know, Silicon Valley for it. So how does this, how do these markets form? So you put this thing out in the wild now. How are you seeing it being being used? I saw the, uh, the POW.market 
was was put up um, recently. Was was that you guys centrally, or did did the community just throw that up? And and how are you seeing that used? It's an example of uh, of this working in action. So, you know, the problem with a lot of the, a lot of the way that we've approached things in the past is that, you know, seeing software development or protocol development as separate from the market, and it's really not. So if, if you kind of raise a lot of money and then try to put together a team that works for a year on a protocol, then you're really, the market is not even getting the ability to contribute, the ability to speculate uh, and the ability to use the work that is being done. So it's much, if, if, for someone in my position who's trying to introduce uh, like something that levels up the whole ecosystem, it's more important for me to give the opportunity to write code to other people. So I put out essentially a demonstrator. I, I didn't you know, push code out to begin with. What I did was I just demonstrated uh, by mining a few proofs of work that there's something interesting going on here, right? And then I was able to engage people have a conversation about um, uh, about you know the incentives and economics and where value comes from, and then that uh, just caused people to kind of click and then build something of their own you know that uh, that can generate revenue. So uh, there's a, a guy who has a, a product called BitSV, and it's uh, essentially a um, a website that you go to. It's essentially a hybrid of you know Reddit and Patreon. So you would post some content and then you would have a, uh, you have to pay five cents, 50 cents a dollar to unlock that piece of content. And he understood the benefit of uh, being able to say, hey, this is the most valuable content in a way that tied to proof of work. And he built that feature into his app and then built a, a, a POW market, you know, website to kind of see what was happening on chain. Um, and he was using a, the, a mining puzzle that uh, came from another guy in the community who understood, and he has a uh, basically a um, uh, distributed uh, uptime testing product. So he would use a blockchain to put up a reward, uh, and then you could run the app on your phone, and you would ping a you know a top 500 website, uh, and then collect the. They would aggregate all the ping data from different parts of the world, and uh, and you know, sell it to any uh, enterprise who, who wanted a, uh, you know, uptime distributed, a real world uh, distributed data set to uh, uptime test their website. And so he understood the benefit of having a puzzle so that then you could have, you know, people out there run an app on their phones and, and make a little bit of Bitcoin in order, uh, you know, as a process of collecting and selling information. And, and, and so essentially, you know, th those two different things in the market where there was someone who was interested in selling information and uh, and someone who is in, well someone who is interested in helping people sell their information and someone who is interested in helping people collect information um, that uh, basically you know understood at different sides of the market about the same time and then were able to 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 put something together. Um, so so as a founder, one of the things as I mentioned that we're trying to explore with this podcast is really the founders and what motivates them and how they're you're going about bringing products or you know foundational technologies to market so in this instance you know there isn't a uh, you haven't done an ico you haven't done any fundraising for this um there isn't uh, at least for now a, a commercial entity um it's all been open sourced so what firstly what motivates you to do this and then secondly how do you as a founder participate in the economic upside that's generated. So, uh, I mean, there is a commercial entity. I have a business, right? And it's a business that I own. Um, and that is, uh, you know, that is all of the branding work and the, and the community development and, and the partnerships and relationships and things that I'm building, you know, go into that company. Um, that's my company. Uh, but the nature of the economics of the system mean that instead of inviting other people and hiring them and raising lots of money and selling my equity, it's it's much more effective for a whole ecosystem. You know, I can put in, in the same way that in a in a regular startup you want other people involved so that you know, the founder can capitalize off of the idea, not just you know the amount of work that one person can do. So uh, instead of trying to have a bottleneck through a single entity. I just encourage other people to, if they want, you know, to invest 
if they want to participate in the ecosystem by building things, you know, just register your own entity, register your own business, and let's do business together, right? And as long as, uh, you know, like my job as a, as a founder is to, to really paint a picture of a big ecosystem and play the role of a leader, right? And like the CEO's job isn't to sit there and the CEO, you know, Steve Jobs isn't sitting there doing the hard engineering work of making an iPhone. You know, he has people that that uh, that do that for them, for him, and get and get paid to do that, right? So by being able to create a market where lots of people can participate and uh, and you know capitalize off of their own contribution, especially in a way that they might see as being more fair, uh, rather than having to deal with like a management hierarchy or having to compete over access to equity. That actually makes the whole ecosystem work uh, um, much better. Otherwise, I would get in, you know, trapped and in, uh, get into the same kind of trap where I would be taking, I would be putting my attention away from the network. I'd be putting my, uh, you know, uh, money into uh, hiring people to work on site, uh, and um, then I would be forced to kind of turn the network into a into a customer user base that I was trying to uh, hold on to. Um, here it's it's much more open and and essentially everyone can take their own risks and make their own decisions and when you need to move as fast as we need to be moving there's not really time to to sit around and um, interview or uh, you know ask for permission to go and build stuff you know things are popping up on GitHub all the time we really want uh, people to understand how this stuff works and if there's something that they think that they can contribute come along and and do it and take advantage of the fact that there's lots of other people who um, who can benefit from this technology, benefit from this ecosystem to capitalize things according to their real value. Yeah. So, but in terms of the structure, so you've structured as almost like a sole trader and you might in, engage into commercial agreements with other entities, but um, how do you, how do you participate in the economic upside? I, I still don't get that. What is the, instrument or the asset well it's essentially you know my net, my reputation and the network effect so in the future you know as, as the network grows in terms of its economic volume right uh that will be worth something and so there will be you know my time is is valuable and as long as i'm creating value in the wider market in the wider ecosystem i won't have any problem getting paid for whatever it is that I. so it's it's the premium on your your time and your brand yeah. that you're yeah you're investing in by, by mm -hmm. putting this thing out there. And the assumption is at some point there will be perhaps multiple ways that that may turn into future commercial value. But at this, at this particular stage, that isn't your concern. Your concern is building the community around the technology, allowing them to apply it to their problems, to have that market form and presumably in the absence of, or perhaps in between that gap, between now and when that happens, you pay the bills how? Well, I mean, I have, like, that's my problem, right? Um, but the main thing is that, uh, you know, there's value today, there's, the, you know, a little bit of money that is going back and forth. Um, so you can obviously, you know, you can speculate and, and be exposed to Bitcoin if like you, if I believe that, that this will make Bitcoin more valuable, you know, then, that's one way to think about it. Right, that's what I was um, trying to get. But get it's not really in terms of speculating Bitcoin. It's about, you know, just playing a long-term game, right? So in the short term, it's really important that I'm not trying to compete with my community. Otherwise, they're not a community that's my competition and they're going to go off and do something else. So I need to create opportunity. I need to get, create space for other people to uh, work towards the same idea, right? And defer the same way that a startup defers uh, its payday into an exit, right? Like I'm, I will just defer, yeah. you know, capitalizing it until someone is, someone can take the whole reins from me and, 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 uh, you know, put an even bigger mission on, on top of this infrastructure that I'm putting together. Yeah. I mean, I think it's really interesting. I've been talking about this quite a lot recently, the idea that there is a generational shift, which I think will be compounded by what's happening now with the after effects of what's happening now with corona in you know the future of work 
and how you know, people like yourselves, you know, top up and coming engineering talent are unlikely to go into a corporation and in- increasingly unlikely to follow the, the classic Silicon Valley, you know, venture startup approach, but instead look to create value within within communities that could be, you know, relatively small clan-like um, formations that you see in DAOs um, or, or something much larger. But it definitely feels feels like there is is a is a, a real generational mm-hmm. shift happening there um look it's been fascinating talking to you uh, i could go on for 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 another hour i think we've already clocked um well mm-hmm. over 45 minutes um so it's going to be really interesting to to track the progress so um maybe just for the viewers how can they how can they follow progress what are the urls could you give the twitter handle and anything else that you think that they should be paying attention to to see the momentum that you'll build? Yeah, with. so uh, look up 2028. Uh, there's a hashtag on Twitter uh, and you can you can mine it. So there uh, is a, um, a 2028 miner puzzle. It's a, um, the, the default miner is in JavaScript. So you're going to have to uh, do some work to optimize it. Uh, other people already have more optimal ones out there and running. Um, but it's an information market, so the 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 value is really in the content that you're deciding to uh, to get an interest in, as opposed to uh, just you know outcompute other people without really thinking about it. There is a kind of growing community, uh, especially on Twitter, but in, in other places as well. Yeah, but uh, the one of the weird things about an information market is that uh, information is not free, so uh, you got to. Uh, in, in order to uh, really participate, you've pay got to, to pay attention. You've got to think for yourself. You've got to think about how you can contribute. Uh, and there's not just a, a token that you can go and exchange and buy. So Great. Well, look, you know, the reason why I, I got you on here alongside, you know, some seasoned and like well-established entrepreneurs in this space is because I, you know, I've always believed you're going to, you're going to create some interesting things, and I think it's great to see this this first thing um, coming off the ramp. Uh, I'm watching eagerly, and it, it's <laughs> testing me intellectually uh, as to uh, as to what's possible. But I'm 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 really enjoying seeing the progress that you're making. So thanks for coming on, and I'm sure we'll speak to you at some point in the future. Yeah, thanks for having me. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please make sure you subscribe, rate, and share your feedback to help us reach as many people as possible with the important mission of Web3.